This is a Mac Mini M2 base model. It's only got 256 gigs of space, eight gigs of RAM, and we've been using it for the past six months for our productions. So this video is gonna be my experience with this computer as our main studio computer for the past six months because I honestly did not think I was gonna keep it. And lo and behold, I'm still using the base model of the Mac Mini M2 computer. So my first concern that I had was switching to Apple Silicon if all my stuff was gonna work. I'm an Ableton user. I've been using Ableton Live for a long time. I use the MPC software as well. I wanted to make sure that worked. I have a few select plugins as well that I wanted to make sure were Apple ready. And at this point in the game of 2023, pretty much everything that I use is Apple Silicon ready or had an update that I could get to make it uh, compatible with the hardware. Moving over project sessions from Ableton wasn't that big of a deal either because they were VSTs and Windows. And as long as I loaded up the VST version in the Mac, it would actually find it. And it would be like, hey, here's the plugin makes sense, matches up. There is definitely gonna be cases where some people are gonna have issues. I don't mean to be ignoring those issues or anything like that. I'm just giving you my perspective on this. So please take that in consideration when you're watching this video. Now, pleasant surprise moving from the Windows computer to the Mac was the Windows computer has a lot of fans because I built it. So, you know, it's, it's kind of noisy. It has a 1080 Ti in there. That's got a couple fans. When I swapped that computer out and brought the Mac mini in and turned it on, I was like, whoa, it's silent. <laughs> because there's literally no fans in the Mac Mini. So if you get a, a Mac Studio, there is a little fan in there. And we actually have a Mac Studio for our editing bay on M1 Max, and I definitely can hear that fan. And it had, does have kind of that whiny pitch type of thing going on if you get close enough to it. Uh, oh, also in terms of drives, obviously I'm not recording everything to the internal drive. It's only 256 gigs, right? So sample libraries are clearly not gonna go onto that drive. It's just gonna be software. So what I did was uh, buy a couple two terabyte SanDisk external drives. And this has been our storage solution so far for holding projects and sample libraries at the moment. And it's been okay. I haven't had any issues with it. It is a bit dongly, <laughs> you know, cause you got these like hanging off the back. There, this is the the Mac mini dongle experience right here. <laughs> I think the, the storage solution isn't really elegant, obviously. You can invest a lot of money into some sort of external storage system, and that's probably what you should do if you do plan on going down one of these paths. I just, I don't recommend getting large internal drive type of stuff with the Macs because it's like super expensive. And coming from like a, a Windows computer building type of environment, I never have like the main boot drive as a data drive. It's always just a boot drive. It stores basic applications and the operating system and that's it. So anything that's like gonna be project file or samples or you know, if I need video type of stuff, it's always gonna be on an external drive or a separate drive from the main boot drive. So I never really thought of the 256 thing or the 512 uh, gig internal drive is like a problem for me personally, but you do have to deal with these dongles if you go this route. And this is kind of like the cheapest solution right here because these guys are about like 100, 150 or so, depending on uh, the market at the time. But you know what's awesome? This guy is so small that you could technically mount it in places that are, that you wouldn't think to put a computer. Like you could put it behind your monitor or something or like against a wall and hook it on there. If you want to have your computer out of the way or just not really in your visible field of view, it's actually a really good solution. So for storage, I bought those additional two terabyte drives. I do have a backup situation, offsite backup situation that I do backup regularly to. They're not my only data storage. The two USB ports are definitely not enough, so I did have to get a USB hub for additional ports that would have been on a regular motherboard for a Windows computer. So there was that additional cost right there. It was like 50 bucks or something. Then I had some other USB hubs I was using prior to this hooked up for the synthesizers to be able to communicate and all that. And also my audio interface, the Motu audio interface had no problem being able to install drivers and then be able to use the Motu audio support. So that's been great. And that has like 44 inputs and 40 outputs. So relatively high input and output, and it's been no problem with this box. I've recorded a lot of tracks, like 30 tracks or so. And again, no issues recording directly to these type of drives, which there shouldn't be. Audio isn't as intensive as video. Essentially what I'm saying is that like the data port speeds and all that, like, are you gonna be able to record lots of audio tracks or something like that to a Mac mini base model it is not a problem. At least for me, it's not been a problem in six months. Again, I was originally planning on just testing out this drive and then returning it in a month and then deciding whether or not I wanted to stick with Windows or go 
down the route of getting a better Mac or like a Mac Mini Pro or maybe a Mac Studio and all that. I think it's funny that I just stayed with the base model, the cheapest model that you can get, and it's been fine. Now, that being said, with it only being eight gigs of RAM and like the base model, you run into memory pressure issues with the operating system if you have lots of stuff open. So if you're the type of person that's gonna have like 15 tabs of Chrome open and then run Ableton, that's where you get into the problems. You will definitely run into audio clicks and pops if you have other things going on in the operating system. So I'm definitely in the habit already of just opening Ableton and that's it when I'm running a session on this computer. And also this computer is designed to be just a studio computer. It's not designed to be like an everyday driver of everything, you know, shopping, emails, video production or anything like that. It's actually just designed to sit in here and be a studio computer. And that's honestly how we like to have it because in the past we have had like laptops and stuff be studio computers. And there's just, there's just more distractions that can happen when you have all your other stuff open and then you're producing music and then you get distracted and go back to YouTube and, go back to the music production and go back to emails and like, yeah, it's too much. So the fact that this computer is, you know, 600 bucks on sale, I think it's been like 500. Uh, it's actually really great to have just a dedicated music production computer and also be so cheap as well. But back to the memory, uh, if you do have other things open, it's gonna be a problem. And also when it comes to video editing, if you just do like HD or single shot 4K type of stuff, you can actually do quite a bit of editing on this computer and just store your footage on an SSD external drive. And you can actually be fine with that. In fact, I did an export test with our previous editing computer, which was an AMD machine 3900X with an RTX 3070. And this guy was able to export that same project in the same amount of time, basically. Suffice to say, surprising amount of video capabilities if you are looking for that. But the memory, pressure situation that happens with the Mac OS is going to be a problem if you have anything else open or if you even decide to push the project a bit further. I think for audio, it hits a bit of a sweet spot being able to handle, I think, most modern productions. What I was not able to test is really high track count situations. So if you are running a ton of orchestral libraries with like, you know, 100 track count in Logic Pro or something like that, I can't tell you. I mean, I'm sure there's a bunch of tests online. You can go and find them right there to see. And honestly, if you're in the situation where you're running 100 track counts all the time with a bunch of sample libraries, why are you getting the base Mac mini? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, you'd probably just get a Mac studio anyways if you're in that situation. Just my personal experience and my two cents on the situation. Also cost wise, you know, it being an Apple, it's like, oh, what are these hidden costs that are gonna be there? And honestly, aside from needing to get an extra USB hub, and some additional external drives, which I probably would have done with the Windows computer anyways, uh, the cost really was just 599, because I already have a monitor, I already have a keyboard, I already have a mouse, all those worked. My mouse is a Logitech, keyboard is a Keychron, so it already had some kind of Mac functionality right there. And I just have a LG monitor. So I didn't really have additional costs. I already owned all the software that I needed. It was just 599 basically, plus tax is what I ended up spending, plus the hard drives and the USB hub. Finally, I should mention, I did have some issues with the MPC software. Originally, I was thinking maybe the machine just wasn't powerful enough because what would happen is I would load up Ableton and then I'd load up the plugin, which is silicon ready, uh, Apple silicon ready for the MPC software. And then I would get clicks and pops. And also buffer size, I forgot to mention that. So I'll talk about that in a moment here. But with the MPC software, I noticed it would just introduce more clicks and pops. So then I'd bring up the buffer to like 500, 512 or whatever and it would take it away for the most part, but sometimes I would still get clicks and pops. And I was like, huh. Well, fast forward to getting the Mac Studio, I ended up loading up the MPC software on there as well, and just ran the MPC software on the Mac Studio to see, and I got the same problems only on a Mac Studio M1 Max. So I think it's just MPC software isn't very well optimized yet. I feel like I also had issues on Windows as well, but off the top of my head, I can't describe them specifically. So maybe in the future it gets fixed. But back to buffer sizes and audio interface support. I have a Motu A28ES. With the Mac so far, it has been excellent. The lowest buffer size I can use though is 64, which is good. But 64 seems to be the lowest where maybe occasionally I'll get a clicker pop. If I have anything else open though, like Chrome, I will definitely get clicks and pops with a 64 buffer size. If I bump it up to 128, it seems to clear it up for the most part. But if I want to be absolutely safe, 256. In fact, it's something that I haven't really talked about in this video yet. I'm nearing the end and like performance wise, I mean, 
it's absolutely faster than the previous Windows computer. If I were to buy a brand new Windows computer with like the latest Intel or AMD stuff, clearly that's gonna be faster. And I'm not denying that fact whatsoever, but switching over from my previous Windows computer, the bump or the leap in um, processing power was surprising given how small and cheap this computer is in comparison. The Apple Silicon seems to be doing some magic. So if you're curious, can you do music production on the cheapest Mac Mini M2? Yes, of course. <laughs> That's pretty obvious, right? So I think I'm probably just gonna keep this computer for the studio.